Ladies and gentlemen, let me say a uh, hearty welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming on this uh, uh, evening of a longer weekend. I'm very grateful that you came, and I think uh, it can become a very interesting evening. I do not want to mention too many uh, official guests. I just want to say a thank you uh, to Dr. Ernst Tuber. He's a board member, and he was ready also to moderate because uh, up to one day ago, I was not sure that I could come, <laughs> and insofar he was ready to uh, moderate on uh, my behalf. Thank you very much, Ernst. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Peter Eider. Uh, we cooperate very much, and it's a special pleasure also to have here Kurt Seinitz, the doyen of uh, uh, the Austrian uh, journalists, especially in international affairs. Yeah, uh, and of course we do not want uh, to talk too long before because we have a very rare speaker today and we would like to use it. It is a more or less unique opportunity to have somebody uh, who really comes from the inside of the system, who knows the inside of the system, who is a specialist not only for politics, but also uh, for economy and uh, for energy. And all those three questions, of course, uh, are playing a very big role at the moment and probably also for the coming years. And insofar, uh, I just want to to uh, say a few words about his uh, CV. Yeah. Vladimir Milov will celebrate his 50th birthday in three weeks. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Uh, he was born not in the center of Russia, but uh, in a smaller town in Kamarov. This is in southwestern Siberia. But of course, already in very young years, uh, he came to Moscow as it was usual, and he studied uh, mining at the Mining University in Moscow. And afterwards, he made a very steep career. Already at the age of 27 or 28, I guess, he was the head of the strategy department of the Federal Energy Commission uh, of uh, Russia. And after that, he became advisor. Uh, he became advisor uh, to the energy minister. And after that, he became the deputy energy minister himself. He made a lot of reform concepts for uh, the energy system in Russia. Uh, but of course, there were big discussions and Putin decided in a different way. And insofar, this also uh, changed his career. But of course, uh, he did stay with the, the matters. He became the founder and the president of the Institute of Energy Policy, uh, a leading independent Russian energy policy think tank, and engaged himself also in politics in different parties, Solidarnost and so on. Uh, maybe you'll tell us a little bit more about it. He has published a lot of books, uh, some of them also together with Boris Nemtsov, and he became uh, a senior advisor uh, for uh, Alexei Navalny in economy and especially also uh, in the, in, for all the questions uh, of energy. Yeah. At the moment, he is uh, living in Vilnius, as far as I know. Uh, maybe this is a little bit more safe, the place for you. <laughs> uh, and he became uh, also a re research associate to the Wilfrid Martin Center in Brussels, where I have the honor to be the head of the Academic Council and where we met just the other day. And uh, this also brought him over here. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Former Minister, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And we tried to do this very informally, 
just start, give us your presentation, the, situ uh, the way you are looking at the situation in Russia at the moment. Uh, what are your fears? What are your visions? What are your expectations? And then after that, we very shortly should go uh, into a discussion and into question and answers, if this is okay. Yeah? Please, thank you. Mr. Uh, Milov. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, many thanks for having me, although in the very difficult uh, times. Uh, there's so much to talk about, but I will try to make my remarks as condensed as possible to leave more room for discussion and uh, questions. I'm sure there will be many. Uh, I think, you know, to make some general points, uh, what we are seeing right now is not a war between Russia and Ukraine. This is an attempt by Vladimir Putin to redraw global order. Uh, about 20 years ago, I read an article in the magazine Russian Global Affairs, which had became increasingly pro-imperialist and chauvinist in the recent years, uh, written by Slava Nikonov, one of the main ideological folks uh, from Putin's camp, a member of parliament, and, and by the way, the grandson of Molotov, the same Molotov who signed the pact, uh, the infamous pact with Ribbentrop. This article was called Back to Concert, meaning uh, a concert of nations of the 19th century as uh, the ideal model of international relations as opposed to liberal rule-based order. So just a handful of powerhouses deciding the fate of the world, exclusive zones of influence, a redrawing border by force. That was said out in the open. It was even published openly 20 years ago. Uh, not many people took this stuff seriously at the time being. I think we, we now probably realize that this was a mistake. Uh, and I think also it's important to understand that uh, it's not just about Ukraine as such uh, what is happening. Uh, it's, it's something bigger because uh, Putin was always in different ways uh, stating that uh, a reconstruction of a major Russian zone of influence, which has become loosely known as Ruski Mir, the Russian world, which is, by the way, not only limited to former Soviet borders, uh, essentially evolved into being a major geopolitical idea and a major idea for domestic politics to sell uh, to the Russian population uh, over... 20 plus years in power of Putin. Uh, so that is important. Uh, his major idea of domestic and international politics, which increasingly are one, they are very much intertwined, uh, hardly separated um, in Putin's mindset, became dominance over some you know, exclusive sphere of influence. Essentially, again, uh, wherever Putin may reach, uh, not only limited to former Soviet borders, but Western Balkans, for example, or like we can go further. If, uh, for those of you who happen to, you know, do this unfortunate thing of watching Russian television these days, they really discuss uh, projecting their influence well beyond the borders of uh, the former uh, Soviet republics. Uh, but there was always one problem. Uh, because you cannot say you dominate the former Soviet or communist space if you do not dominate Ukraine. Uh, because Ukraine obviously is the, the biggest, most powerful uh, of all these countries uh, except for Russia itself. And, you know, uh, looking at what's happening right now, uh, I can't help but recall my experience when I used to work in the government uh, 20 years ago. Uh, my inner Sherlock Holmes tells me that, listen, something clicks here, because when I was working at the Federal Energy Commission, the Energy Ministry, I was always familiarized with minutes uh, of Putin's meetings with major international leaders. Bush, Blair, Prodi, uh, who was there, Schroeder, and, and so on. And it was always like, you know, at, at the time, I probably didn't notice this too much, but I do recall it now. 
if you go through all that papers, through all that minutes of different meetings, it was all Ukraine, 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 Ukraine. 20 years ago. Ukraine this, Ukraine that. We're discussing uh, transfer of control over Ukrainian gas pipeline network to Gazprom. Russian oil companies are buying Ukrainian refineries. Uh, we want to establish a common space, common market with Ukraine, whatever. You could see a clear fixation uh, on the Ukrainian issue, which, which did not emerge just recently. It, 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 was, uh, it was heavily present by, back then, long ago. It was not exclusively Putin's idea, uh, because uh, there's this guy uh, who was well known as uh, a major reformer of Russia in the 90s, Anatoly Chubais. The, the, the author of uh, privatization of the 90s. In 2003, uh, in the wake of Russia's parliamentary election campaign, he wrote an article, or was it a speech? Uh, but nonetheless, it was called nothing else than liberal empire. Liberal empire. Chubais argued that Russia should establish control over strategic assets in the countries uh, and the neighboring ourselves. And uh, through that, project its influence. Chubais made it look like this was a force for good. Like Russia would be a democratic country and project democratic and liberal uh, uh, sort of influence. However, in reality, they really went on buying many strategic assets, investing in many oligarchs, politicians across the board, across our neighboring regions. But however, they changed, uh, they changed the sign from plus to minus, from, from good to evil, from, from liberal to essentially, sorry, I'm just quoting the recent, one of the recent New York Times articles. Uh, the headline was, Russia is fascist and we should say it. So there was uh, the very same concept of Chubai's liberal empire coming to life, but with a totally different sign. So I think we should really look at the systemic uh, nature of events that were happening. It was all in the making for quite some time. Disrespect for international liberal rule-based order. Uh, Putin's war that was launched on the 24th of February was by far not at all the first example of that, of a total disrespect for international rules. Putin and his government, they have been throwing their international legal liabilities into dustbin at will, multiple times. Budapest Memorandum and the Minsk agreements are just a couple of examples on, on surface. So I think what we are seeing right now is a culmination uh, of attempts of um, redrawing global order, uh, restoring the principle of might makes right, uh, normalization of redrawing borders and establishing zones of influence by force. What we're seeing right now in Ukraine is, is a culmination of that. And there were many, many early warning signs coming before. Uh, we can remember, I'm sure, you know, uh, um, uh, plenty of these things. So I think uh, I, I listened to many, uh, many commentators, uh, politicians, experts uh, in the Western world who are saying that, listen, for the sake of peace, we need to get uh, into some sort of agreement with Putin, sort of give him what he wants. Uh, I have a big question to these people, um, which is actually, are you really sure that when he receives something from the Western world after brutally attacking a neighboring country by force, uh, that he will stop? That he will not be encouraged by the fact that he tried, he tried to break the rule-based order and, and uh, brutally attack a neighboring country and was rewarded? with some concessions, something like that. Won't it stimulate him to go further? Uh, I think there is, there is no other way but, but to positively answer this question, which I think all these debates about uh, potential agreement, 
given away some Ukrainian territory, internationally recognized. Uh, this is not even naive. It's beyond naive. It's pretty cynical. I think it just this whole concept doesn't hold water because Putin is aiming not just some parts of the territory of Ukraine. He's aiming at redrawing the global order, nothing less. And that's important to understand. We'll be happy to have a further uh, debate on this. Uh, but I think um, what is also important to understand is that uh, after three months of the war, we can clearly see that Putin's system is overstretched. He took too much weight with this invasion, uh, which he cannot really handle. You see that his army is not coping uh, with this conflict, which was pretty visible. And uh, uh, when, when this war started, I was uh, with, in the United States with a lot of uh, well-known experts, like we were arguing between themselves because Many of them repeated uh, what the, the press had said, referring to the U.S. intelligence, like Kyiv is going to fall within 96 hours. I said, no, this is not going to be the case. I have actually commented on all these issues uh, months before the war and highlighted publicly on record uh, the vulnerabilities of the Russian army, the underestimation of Ukrainian uh, resistance, uh, and uh, many other important factors. Another issue, uh, we can clearly see what a significant impact sanctions are having on Russia. Uh, I think that's a very unique example of a deglobalization of a major economy uh, that has not happened before on that scale. Because countries like Iran or North Korea, they are not nearly as important as uh, uh, participants of uh, the international markets and division of labor as Russia is. And it's being very severely cut off and cut off for a prolonged period of time. Uh, I think it's uh, clear that uh, there will be no return to normality at least uh, as long as uh, the current regime is in power in Russia. Uh, it, it's not just about the sanctions that are imposed by the Western governments. Uh, I think probably even bigger impact is happening because of the withdrawal of uh, international companies from, from doing business with Russia, participating in uh, Russia's projects. Uh, that is having a tremendous effect, which we are yet to measure. And it's hard to measure with uh, statistics. Statistics doesn't show it because, uh, for instance, uh, just a you know, relatively minor issue of supply of heat exchangers for uh, a major Arctic LNG project by Novatech, uh, by Linde, German company, which had withdrawn from the project since the war began. This heat exchanger issue can bring the whole big LNG project to a halt because there is no replacement. You can't manufacture them in China and uh, elsewhere. By the way, you see that uh, Chinese companies and banks themselves are, you know, voluntarily also withdrawing from many projects with Russians because on one hand they see a lot of risks uh, uh, with Russia's exposure to international sanctions and on the other hand, uh, Russia is uh, enormously losing at attractiveness as an opportunity this deeply troubled economy is not so attractive for Chinese or Indian uh, or other partners anymore as it was just uh, uh, several months ago. So we'll be happy to talk more about the effect of sanctions, which uh, will, will be become visible gradually because right now we still have significant oil and gas revenues, which will shrink. We still have uh, some... Uh, projects continuing to operate for some additional months because the withdrawal of Western companies will also be gradual. Uh, we see some warehouses and stockpiles uh, still not completely depleted. But further down the road, we'll see more disruptive effects and uh, the Russian economy will find itself in a bigger trouble. To sum up, uh, I think the major impact of sanctions will be extreme loss uh, of a quality of life uh, for the Russian people. Uh, we, we can see it happening already on uh, many fronts, like just a very recent uh, 
uh, opinion poll research have shown that Russians have, um, are confirming a very significant deterioration of the quality of food that is available in uh, grocery stores. The other issue, for instance, is that uh, Aeroflot, our flagship uh, air carrier, is about to begin cannibalizing its own fleet uh, using Boeing and Airbus aircraft for spare parts because spare parts are no longer available uh, at the international market anymore. And actually, you just need to Google, like, deficit of spare parts. Uh, I mean, deficit of server capacity for digital infrastructure, deficit of seed bank for agriculture and harvesting, whatever. I mean, I can go on for hours. Uh, all this will have significant disruptive effects, and... Um, there has been a lot of hopes among the Russian elite that we might refocus on Asia uh, and uh, actually divert ourselves away from Europe. Like, okay, if Europe imposes oil embargo, then we will sell everything uh, to China and India. Uh, it, it's not so easy. It's easier said than done. Uh, because and I also uh, I think it's worth reading for those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, I produced um, uh, a big research paper for the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies in November about the uh, failing Russia-China economic partnership, uh, which was announced as a big thing eight years ago in 2014, uh, when the rift with the West began because of the first stage of invasion uh, of Ukraine. Putin then announced that, okay, problems with the West, we're going to turn to China and forge a great economic partnership with them. So actually what I did in this paper, again, I suggest it's worth reading, is that I, I did a cross-check of all the ambitious economic agenda and various projects that were announced in 2014. Bottom line, uh, about 80% of them never went anywhere because there is significant lack of economic gravity uh, between Russia and China. We're separated. Most of Russia's economic activity is concentrated in the European part of the country, including the oil and gas production. Western Siberia is still Europe uh, and is bound to European market. To reach uh, Asian oil and gas markets, we would need to build totally new infrastructure, which will be uh, several times more expensive than what we spent in the past uh, few decades uh, to build infrastructure connecting us to the European market. Because we're separated with all these vast distances, mountains, and, uh, and so on. Like, for instance, when I talk to oil industry guys, uh, uh, and this happened even years before, and I said to them, what do you think about uh, increasing uh, oil exports to India? They say, look, uh, our major uh, export directions are Baltic and Black Sea ports, which are relatively shallow. They can't, uh, they can't really handle super tankers. They can only handle smaller tankers. And to export oil from, from the Baltic Sea to India, you need to go Danish Straits, Gibraltar, Suez Canal, Bab el Mandeb Strait. All the you know, uh, shippers and insurers, they simply go crazy about all these routes saying, can you please show us something simpler than that? So it's difficult. Uh, the costs are significantly higher. The costs of uh, diverting oil and gas flows to China and India will be significantly higher. And also Chinese and Indians are extremely pragmatic people. They obviously are well aware of the trouble that Russia is finding itself in. So if you just simply browse the headlines about all this stuff, you see China demands discounts. India demands discounts. Uh, April data, I think the May data would be even worse, but April data shows that the average price of the Urals crude, the main uh, Russian uh, oil expert uh, crude, was $70 per barrel. And uh, the average price of brand crude was 105 so 35 bucks per barrel uh, price differential. And uh, I think it's going to worsen uh, further. So we're going to receive less money and it's going to cost us more, which means that, okay, we can technically 
divert some stuff to Asia, but it's going to bring significantly less profits from oil and gas exports. So it's not going to work to the extent that many people are uh, discussing in the media. So bottom line, we'll be happy to discuss this further, uh, but sanctions are working. And generally, I think uh, the whole Putin system was not designed to withstand uh, this level of economic pressure and disconnect from global markets, financial system, technologies, logistics, and so on. I think really many experts are pointing out that uh, we're really sliding somewhere back to the level of 1980s. Uh, in terms of uh, the modernity of technologies and production, uh, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of living standards and so on, uh, that will have significant impact on the public opinion. Not yet, because it's a gradual process, but public opinion also is uh, significantly shifting. Uh, you heard a lot of uh, headlines that majority of Russians, uh, 70, 80 percent, support Putin's invasion, which is, uh, I wouldn't say that it's completely untrue, uh, but there's a lot of nuance uh, to what is happening in Russia domestically, because uh, point number one, uh, many people in the West have absolutely no idea uh, what kind of propaganda and disinformation bubble uh, Russians are living in majority of the country is totally disconnected from, from uh, the truthful information. Also, it's, it's important, uh, that I, for those of you who are interested, I can send you some links to my, my uh, detailed articles in English analyzing uh, Russian public opinion polling, but point number one, uh, uh, there's very little awareness of what is going on in Ukraine. Like Levada poll says that the number of Russians who say they closely follow the events in Ukraine is less than 30%. <laughs> Which means that point number one, I think it's not fair to mention 70-80% support uh, figure without mentioning the other one. That not that many people are closely watching what's going on. Russians in the past decade, uh, they have used uh, to having some sort of a background war somewhere. Donbass, Syria, Georgia, and so on. We were always at war with somebody, so the fact that we have another war before people see the consequences does not really produce uh, a major public opinion change immediately. But the public opinion change is also there. Uh, because what we have right now is uh, like end April polling data, which is drastically different from what we saw in March. Uh, support for what Putin is doing in Ukraine is visibly declining. I would say even sharply declining. Uh, uh, trust towards state television is also declining in big numbers. People are shifting towards uh, social media as a major source of uh, alternative information to, to state propaganda. Uh, Russian YouTube, which is, that's a very important point, is still, over three months of Putin's war against Ukraine, it is still not blocked. I'll be happy to tell you more about that, but bottom line is that uh, uh, there are very significant constraining factors for Putin uh, regarding domestic public opinion he cannot afford everything. Some things will, be, will backfire, will be painful, because over 100 millions of Russians are using YouTube regularly uh, for entertainment purposes, mainly. And you can't, YouTube refuses to take down individual videos, you can only shut it down as a whole, and that will be a terribly unpopular move, which is why, uh, which is why the Russian government is forced to tolerate whatever we are saying. Uh, we are, my colleagues in the opposition, I think we are very much successful in, in reaching out to the Russian audience in the past uh, few weeks and months. Like in, in March uh, this year, uh, the audience of Navalny Live YouTube channel, where I, I have a regular broadcasts, exceeded 20 million people, unique viewers, per month. 
over 90% of them are from Russia. That is one si about one sixth of the total adult population. And I would dare say about half of the politically active population which pays attention to politics. So uh, our broadcasting that we do from abroad, but still we, we are Russian citizens speaking for the Russians, that bears fruit and also influences a change in uh, public opinion. So what happens to the citizens of my country is that they only gradually begin to realize what is actually really going on. When many people learn, they are obviously terrified. Of course, uh, I wouldn't argue with the fact that there is a significant part uh, of the population which is infested with this Putin's new imperialist fever, which is very anti-Western, which does not have any empathy towards Ukraine and Ukrainians at all. Uh, I would agree, there is a significant part of the population which, which shares that views, but definitely not a majority. Uh, and and there, is a, there is a very big part of, of the Russian people who are simply unaware of what's going on. They lack truthful information. This is actually what we are right now mostly focused on and committed uh, on doing, is uh, changing, fundamentally changing Russian public perceptions about Putin and what he's doing in Ukraine. I think it's, uh, it's a very important task which I call uh, opening a third front against Putin, the first front uh, happening on the battlefields of Ukraine and Ukrainian resistance, the second front being sanctions, the third front being the change of public opinion in Russia. Uh, my assessment is that uh, Putin's system will not be able to withstand all this pressure. I think it's counterproductive to try to draw uh, scenarios for how the situation will evolve because, uh, let me tell you this, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. It is an extremely difficult thing uh, to diagnose uh, uh, fatigue cracks in a big complicated mechanism. Particu particularly a very closed mechanism which we don't have access to what's going on. Uh, one specific warning, uh, as a person who worked, worked for six years in the Russian government and who knows many persons who are still out there with some sources uh, inside the government, most of what you hear uh, about what's going on inside the Kremlin, inside the Russian government, is not true. Most of what you hear is not true. About Putin's cancer, about people plotting to overthrow, he, overthrow him, that is not true. Again, we'll be happy to elaborate. But uh, so, so what I'm saying is that this is actually a very closed environment and it became more closed recently because people, the insiders, are simply afraid to talk. Uh, they, they're really afraid to talk, to say something, crossing the red lines, and that they will talk to some undesired persons and will be punished for that. So we don't know what happens inside this big mechanism. But it suffered such a big structural damage from the military losses in Ukraine, from Western sanctions, so my personal assessment is that it won't be able to withstand it. It will crack at some point. We do not know how and when, but I think uh, for all the people who, who hold dear the liberal international rule-based order, sovereignty and uh, decency of uh, Russia's neighboring countries, including Ukraine in the first place, for all the people who hold dear precious human life, uh, there's terrible suffering and terrible loss of life that going on in Ukraine by now in this unprovoked war. Uh, it is important uh, for all, all the people of the free world to actually double down on any possible efforts which will make life harder for Putin's regime and bring these fatigue cracks in the system closer. I would strongly advise against you know, drawing the scenarios, the exact scenarios about how this will happen, we do not know. I personally compare uh, the current period in, in, in Russian history with 1983-84. Uh, 
the post-Brezhnev period on drop of Chernenko and so on, when uh, th there, were, there were pretty dark years, when we were really living in fear of uh, outbreak of major uh, nuclear conflict with the West, when repressions had intensified, uh, particularly since Andropov uh, took power. And back then, in 83, 84, uh, if you would say to anybody, like, it's, it's, it's important, in, in 1984, not the Orwellian 1984, but Chernenko's 1984, the, one of the last years of the Soviet Union, we had, don't laugh, uh, elections. <laughs> Last totally not free and not fair Soviet elections into Soviet parliament, Verkhovny Soviet SSR. And the result was like, when this is, we go back to the issue of opinion polls and how many people support Putin. In 1984, the result of elections was like 99.9% .9 for the Communist Party, like unanimity. Several years down the road, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people across the country were on the street demanding uh, Communist Party gone. It just happened within a very few years uh, framework. In 1984, if anybody told us that this would happen just a just few years afterwards, Anyone would say, you're crazy. So it may seem right now. But uh, really knowing a lot about uh, what is uh, happening inside the country at the moment, uh, we can see that uh, some part of the society is mobilized by television, by propaganda. It's also very visible because it's being amplified. It resonates with state propaganda, so it makes it look like there's a majority. There's not a pro-war majority. Uh, the country is uh, learning with shock and terror about what is really happening. That is a very gradual process. We try to contribute to this as fast as we can. Economic troubles will also uh, bring very significant changes to public opinion. Uh, now, bottom line, I will conclude with this. Sometime further down the road, maybe before the end of the year, we will see both the Russian public and the Russian nomenclatura openly questioning what Putin is doing. Where, where do we go from here? What's the purpose of this whole thing? Uh, and uh, maybe we should rethink, uh, rethink our policy, rethink the war, uh, rethink what Putin has been doing. Me and my colleagues, we believe that uh, this will eventually happen, so we should really contributing uh, to stopping what Putin is doing in Ukraine. It, it, again, it's not just about Ukraine. If, if he is allowed to continue in Ukraine, he will not stop. He will go well beyond. He should be stopped, uh, and sanctions are very effective in this regard. They are working, but we need more. Ukrainian resistance is extremely impressive. Ukrainian people are extremely brave and courageous. And uh, they are the main factor that, that gives us hope at the moment that uh, Putin's totalitarian, uh, totalitarian onslaught will be defeated. But it's possible, and I think eventually it will happen, that we open a third front, domestic front inside Russia. It's already working. We are, I think, quite successful in that. It takes time. But I think the figure has already shown that the, the collapse in, in public approval is uh, remarkable. We're going to double down on it, and um, we believe that, that at the end of the day we'll be successful. There's so much to talk about. I don't want to go into really very lengthy introductory speech, so I'll probably stop here, and we'll be happy to take your questions and listen to your comments. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, Mr. Ilov, thank you very much for your presentation. And I think everybody could feel that it was not just uh, a theoretical presentation, but that you are not only an insider, but living with uh, the development of Russia and also the inner substance. OK, we have, of course, a lot of questions. And the first one will be uh, Dr. Seinitz. I want to keep, can continue. 
How will, how will the regime end? Coup d'etat, military regime, revolution. What's the... Uh, uh, short answer is we don't know. And again, uh, my approach is that it's really very hard to predict, so probably we shouldn't bother predicting it. But we should try to do everything possible to weaken it and to create a pretext. Because weak regime would collapse one way or another. So the task is to weaken it right now. Now, a few things. First, I do not believe in any sort of coup d'etat uh, for several reasons. Uh, point number one. Putin's been systemically getting rid over more than 20 years in power of any kind of potentially challenging figures. Ministers, charismatic politicians, regional governors, they're all gone. He's surrounded by a technocratic yes men and yes women. Uh, point number two, this is what I keep hearing when I talk to my former colleagues who are still working there inside the system. They say, listen, uh, we are panically afraid to even speak between ourselves because there's a predominant chance that we will be recorded and the recording will be brought to Putin's table. Uh, so even a, like a discussion of these things that Putin is doing something bad and we need to get rid of him, even in one-on-one -on -one meetings, is pretty challenging. People are afraid to discuss this because they don't know who is listening, right? Uh, discussion of this stuff uh, in meetings involving like four, five, six or more people is impossible because you never know who's going to snitch on them and report to Putin, right? So this is not all this talk about coup d'etat is extremely hypothetical because in practice they're just, they're simply afraid to even think about this because FSB might scan their mind, you know, <laughs> and report uh, to Putin. The problem number three is that military security and paramilitary agencies are extremely divided. There's bitter rivalry between them. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to imagine circumstances when they will be coming together, particularly for such a challenging task. And if they do not come together, uh, and the manpower is significantly divided between uh, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Interior, the National Guard, plus, very important, something which is often missing from that uh, coup d'etat analysis. Putin has established uh, a very powerful uh, uh, separate service called Presidential Guard, Federalnes Lushba Akhrane, Federal Guard Service. About 50,000 personnel extremely well paid and they are pay I mean they're specifically motivated to guard the president regardless of what nuclear war whatever they are specifically paid to guard the president important point you probably remember the August 91 coup d'etat when Gorbachev was cut off from communications now communications are no longer, I mean, not the presidential communication, but the whole secret government communications are no longer controlled by FSB, the former, the successor of KGB, no longer. In 91, it was part of KGB, not now. Communications are controlled by presidential guard. That's important. No minister or general who want to overthrow him can cut, off, can cut him off communications. Uh, moreover, Putin controls communications, not them. <laughs> he can cut them off. Uh, that is, so, I mean, th there are many, uh, I would even say, this is all important. But if you ask my, my opinion, uh, what is probably more important is that in the current situation, to overthrow Putin and, uh, you know, assume power, saying, I'm the ruler now, or, you know, a collective ruling committee, whatever, it will be such a challenging task. We are in such a mess that you gotta be like Winston Churchill plus to handle this stuff. There are no Winston Churchills there. Uh, so I, I think the, what, what I hear is that uh, people, the, the very high positions, they go like, wow, we're in such a mess, who, who is gonna fix it? Definitely, 
they would prefer to sort of abstain because there, there is no line of heroes who want to take charge of fixing this whole mess that uh, Putin uh, created. So I don't believe in coup d'etat. I also think that the Russian military is, um, has been not only specifically depoliticized uh, in the past decades, but also it is effectively taken over by the FSB. If you take a look at like deputy ministers, people infiltrated in the uh, chiefs of staff uh, and so on, there are many FSB ambassadors who effectively control with tentacles, you know. Uh, yes, right, right, right. So, uh, so uh, in, w when you go in, in practical terms, it's really very, very hard to imagine something like this happening. So, what, what my scenario mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, Putin's authority will begin to eventually decline, probably fast, when he will begin to be questioned by his own nomenclature and the society about the direction where things are going, and, and nothing will happen. So people will see that it's possible to question him more. Remarkable feature of the present week is that some, some important political figures have openly started to talk about consequences of what they call a special military operation. Kaliningrad governor, there was a famous spat between Putin and Kaliningrad governor Alikhanov, who said, special operation ruined all our logistics uh, uh, in Kaliningrad region. And Putin interfered and said, you shouldn't say that. This has nothing to do with special operation. Uh, next day, uh, transport minister and the former CEO of Aeroflot Savelyev uh, visits Astrakhan, the main Russian city on the Caspian Sea, talking about developing a north-south corridor from Baltic to the Caspian, and openly says on the record that our logistics has been ruined because of sanctions. These are just, I mean, early signs. There will be more in the coming years. Once this becomes commonplace, that everything is ruined and people openly talk about it, then Putin's authority will go down and I think even the society will feel that it's, it's okay now to, to, to openly question what, what the government is doing. Uh, that, was, that was what was happening in mid-80s because Gorbachev started perestroika not out of nothing. Soviet government has lost authority to that extent. So like I remember, uh, I was a school kid. Everybody in school in Moscow and all the parents, all the people I saw, they were speaking extremely negatively uh, of, of, of the Soviet government. The, by by uh, early 1985, the authority was like totally lost. Uh, people lost faith. Uh, in, in a communist system that it can move forward and fix things. So I think Perestroika was not just the invention of Gorbachev, it was also because they knew. It was also the response to this you know, public uh, demand. So I think we, we're moving somewhere in that direction, but I would refrain from making very specific predictions of how and particularly when uh, this regime might collapse. Thank you. Yeah, we have... Um, uh, thanks for the fabulous speech. Um, I wanted to ask one and a half questions about uh, the energy sector. Uh, first of all, um, since you have been involved in, in uh, that sort of department of the Russian government back in the days, like 20 years ago, when most of the major plans in exporting gas and oil through pipelines came to Europe and advanced in that sense, um, which kind of... Um, I would say power was already back then uh, in Russia's mind in, in, a, in a regards to um, we can actually project power through the dependence of European states because of our gas and oil. And also uh, we had a pipeline project which fell through a few years ago that was Nabucco. And I would be interested what Russia's thought were back in the day when uh, this uh, was announced and what Russia did in order to make it fail, if you know that. Well, I have to say, you probably, it's hard to believe that, uh, but I remember that very well. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, opinions within the Russian elite were uh, divided, uh, I would say roughly in half. There were some people who wanted to talk about projecting influence, creating some exclusive zone of dominance and so on. 
there were others, and they were very influential, uh, very loud, who said, listen, we need to drop that thing. We need to build common market, common space. Uh, Russian neighboring countries, I mean, let them integrate into the EU. This is where we should be going. I even heard from like people like federal ministers, deputy prime ministers. I even heard 20 years ago words like, it's good that Central and Eastern European countries are joining NATO because they will receive a signed and sealed paper that they are protected now and maybe they will stop hating us and we're going to build a common market. So uh, actually 20 years ago, uh, there was a competition between the two visions inside uh, Russian power. What happened is that Putin had completely squeezed out and uh, silenced all the people from, from, from the positive integration camp. He only fueled uh, the imperialist uh, aspirations. Uh, so this is why, like, you know, uh, speaking about pipelines, uh, we had a very open argument inside the government and no small number of officials, including myself, were saying, listen, the best way to go for us uh, in terms of uh, expanding our capacities to supply gas to Europe is enhancing and modernizing the Ukrainian transit network because it's relatively cheaper than building all these insane, overly costly bypassing pipelines. Ukraine is a reliable partner despite all this Kremlin talk about Ukraine stealing uh, transit gas, there was never ever a case when Gazprom managed to prove in court that one single cubic meter was stolen. Ukraine, before uh, 2005, Ukraine also provided us with the cheapest transit tariffs ever. You can just go, I mean, uh, Energy Charter Secretariat has been doing regular papers and comparisons of uh, gas transit tariffs in various European countries, and Ukraine was always the cheapest option. So there was, and, and we did this, we discussed this with the uh, Prodi uh, Commission and with Loyola de Palacio, the, 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 the energy commissioner, uh, that we simply need to jointly invest about 5 billion euros in upgrading of Ukrainian transit network, and it will be the best way to export Russian gas more volumes, all the volumes that Europe needs and we need for, uh, for revenue. But there were others who said that uh, uh, Ukraine is bad because it doesn't want to give, uh, give up control over its uh, transit network. So as long as it does not give up control, we need to build bypassing pipelines to, to force it to give up control. And if it still doesn't give up control, then we need to seize transit and ship the gas through Baltic Sea, Black Sea, whatever, right? So there were two schools of thought. Uh, you obviously know uh, which one. Speaking about Nabucco, obviously the second, uh, the imperialist uh, school of thought, they were always against any sort of alternative uh, pipelines that were not linked with Russia and delivered alternative uh, sources of gas to European market bypassing Russia. Now, we were pretty much okay with it because uh, to folks like myself and some other colleagues, uh, the key issue was Russia's own competitiveness. Like, if we produce a competitive product, we will be able to sell it, no matter which pipelines you build through Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, whatever. I mean, let them be. The, the, the origins of our success is ourselves making a competitive product. But the other school of thought said, listen, we got to block all the attempts and establish a monopoly. That's monopoly versus competition. That's the, essentially the ideology. This is why I left the government, because I, I understood that there's, there's no room for, for uh, my ideas, which was competition is always better than monopolism. Putin's vision and the vision of people who uh, prevailed in this rivalry was that we need to establish a monopoly and we need to stem big rents, super profits from, you know, monopolistic situation on the market. That was the origin of, of the... So, uh, unfortunately, that, that second school of thought, Putin's school of thought, imperialist school of thought, prevailed also in the energy sector. I hope that answers your question.
Okay, thank you. The two neighbors. Yeah, short questions, please. Yeah, yeah. If you could just uh, shortly talk about the Kremlin's perception of the Chinese and specifically in a little bit louder. Uh, if you could Chinese, just yeah. uh, sh shortly talk about the Kremlin's perception of the Chinese, uh, specifically the Chinese Communist Party, and um, do you think the Chinese and the Russians will come together in a sort of, uh, Xi Jinping announced a few weeks back, the Global Security Initiative, uh, a sort of Warsaw Pact 2.0. Yes, thank okay. you. Yeah, we take the second. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that the sanctions hitting Russia uh, have been very effective. Now, in your opinion, which one would you say is the most efficient of all the sanctions ongoing at the moment? Thank you very much. I'll, I'll start with the second question. Um, uh, I would advise against cherry picking on this, the most powerful. Now, obviously, one of the game changers was uh, freezing the assets of the central bank. But it's, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, I continuously argue against uh, trying to find some just one magic silver bullet. Uh, the, the most effective principle is all of the above creating multiple sources of pressure. Uh, I think the, the, the most uh, important and unique feature of the current sanctions is the combination of two factors. First, sanctions introduced by the governments, and second, uh, withdrawal of companies, uh, which is not dictated by sanctions. It's, it's voluntary in a lot of ways because the companies are obviously against what Putin is doing in Ukraine. So I think the, the combination of two, that's... That's a very, very uh, uh, uncomfortable sandwich for Putin. So on top you have government sanctions, on the bottom you have companies withdrawal. So you are cut off from everything, as, as I said. Financial markets, uh, markets of goods and services, uh, logistics, uh, insurance, uh, technology, whatever, right? So no searching for a magic silver bullet, but combining and keeping the pressure and new sanctions every week. Now, where's the EU is talking about the six package now, where is it? <laughs> uh, so new sanctions every week is uh, much worse for Putin than just, you know, one, one big Tsar bomb of sanctions, you know. Now on China, uh, I would advise, uh, again, I mentioned it, but I would advise uh, to read my uh, paper for the Wilfred Martin Center, it came out in November. Uh, it, called, it was called Ambitions Dashed, Why Sino-Russian Economic Cooperation is Not uh, Working. One of the important features I outline is that a Russia-China relation is complicated. It, it has some extent of convergence of interests, essentially the collective defense of authoritarianism versus uh, liberal democratic order. But then uh, you go through differences and they are huge. Uh, competing interests, competing visions. I would say uh, uh, on surface, uh, there are significant common interests in counterweighting Western democracies. <laughs> if you scratch the surface, there are so much more, like competition in Central Asia. You asked about what Russian elite is thinking. They are absolutely angry about Chinese advances uh, in Central Asia and influence uh, over Central Asian governments. Just, you know, uh, just imagine uh, that great majority of Central Asian gas is flowing to China now. It's 10 times bigger than Russian exports uh, uh, of gas uh, to China. Uh, and also Russia supplies gas at much cheaper price, about 30% cheaper than Turkmenistan. So all of them are outplaying us in uh, Central Asia and I mean many issues. Uh, Russians uh, are particularly unhappy, you know, when they have all these uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization summits somewhere in Central Asia and they arrive in the summit capital city and the slogans across the city, the billboards are in Chinese, not in Russian. Makes them really mad. So I would say, I, I do not know, I can only guess, and somewhat speculate here, but my understanding 
is that it is only Putin and some very narrow inner circle, like Patrushev and some other guys, who are really invested in this idea that uh, China will be our savior and best uh, global body and partner. Uh, majority of, of the rest of uh, Russian elite is fearful of China, is well aware that we're essentially losing uh, a competition to China in many ways, that we are no match, that China is so much bigger that there can be no such thing as equal partnership. Over time, they will simply swallow us Particularly, if uh, the current uh, the current nature of relations is very disadvantageous for Russia, because Russia is very much weakened by everything that happened, and China is positioned to take advantage. Uh, many people in the Russian elite uh, realize that, so it's a complicated relationship, and I think uh, people in the West should be aware of all these cracks on the pavement of uh, all the weaknesses. Okay, thank you. The lady in the second row. Thank you very much. And also for the somewhat optimistic uh, perspective uh, you gave us. Uh, five days ago, a conference took place here by the Institute for Human Sciences. You may know it, uh, with quite a number of dis uh, distinguished uh, scholars and experts. And one of them was Olivia Lazar, working for Carnegie Europe. She's a scholar at Carnegie Europe and right now also a fellow at the Institute here in Vienna. And she uh, emphasized that this war in Ukraine, seen from the perspective of Putin, is also an attempt to further reduce the access of the West to rare uh, material, rare uh, raw material, rare earth, necessary for the um, energy transformation and, uh, and in view of the climate change. She did some studies on the Wagner Group in the Congo Basin, you may know all this, uh, but also in Ukraine uh, we know that there are important uh, resources of these materials. How do you see this uh, analysis that Putin is trying? She didn't say that he would succeed, of course, but that he is trying with this war to further, as I said, limit or even cut off the access of the West to such uh, uh, strategically very important uh, resources. Uh, listen, I would advise against uh, oversimplification and narrowing down of what's happening towards some very, very practical uh, issues. Like when we had the war uh, in Chechnya in the 90s, uh, a lot of people said it's all about Chechen oil, it's all about the pipeline which is transporting Caspian crude. It was much bigger than that. It was much bigger than that. So it is now. So yeah, I mean, there might be some, you know, uh, additional components to what Putin is doing, some, some, some additional advantages as, as it seems to his mind and to the minds of his advisors, right? Uh, which might also include this. But generally I have to say the, the, the picture is much bigger than just some narrow practical interests in rare earth. It's, um, okay, please no discussion. <laughs> okay. But the conflict, is, it evolved over time. We saw how it evolved. We also saw, uh, I, I think there's one simple exercise uh, that might give you an idea that uh, in Ukraine, Putin is going after something much bigger than just metals, rare earth. You just, you track his comments about Ukraine over years you see how much effort and attention he invested in, in Ukraine on you know, various parts of it, being gas transit network, uh, being uh, security issues and placement of Russian troops, whatever. Uh, there, were, there were many aspects of it. This is a multi-dimensional uh, thing. So uh, yeah, I understand that this is an important issue but my point is that this whole uh, war and aggression is about much bigger picture than just that. Yeah, please over here, Ketele and uh, the neighbor. Thank you very much for your very Just a moment, the micro, please. 
Thank you very much for your very interesting perspectives. <coughs> My name is Ron Willis. I tend to look at things a little bit from a New Zealand point of please view. Please louder, please. I tend to look at things a little bit from a New Zealand point of view because that's where I come from. A um, couple of questions. One, is Russia totally self-sufficient on oil and gas extraction technology? Can they keep on producing a large volume <coughs> without the big Western companies? Because when we look at all the big projects in Russia, they seem to have all been carried out with one of the big Western oil companies assisting. Second question is, would... It's a, an interesting question how to put, uh, how to uh, phrase this. Would President Putin be silly enough to unilaterally resort to the nuclear option? Uh, thank you very much. First, on self-sufficiency, no. Russia is definitely not self-sufficient. It, it, can, it can produce a lot of oil and gas. <laughs> Particularly, this is, this is more important related to oil uh, than to natural gas. Because uh, a majority of Russian uh, oil field stock is pretty matured, depleted. So a lot really depends on technology, of how do you enhance uh, output. And that, uh, the best technology is obviously controlled by Baker Hughes, uh, Slumberger, Halliburton. Their withdrawal, if it happens, because they, they did not make it fully clear what, what they're up to, if they, if they withdraw, uh, that will have a significant impact. I would say, if you want a rough estimate, like 30, 40 percent of the output in matured Western Siberian fields, which is still the major producing region, uh, is related to technologies that are b brought by Americans. So that, that will be a very significant decline in uh, productivity Imagine they withdraw. Th there is no replacement. Russian technology, Chinese technology is, is not a replacement for unique enhancement uh, techniques that they uh, possess. It's, it's not going to be the end of the world, but the impact will be significant. And also costs will rise. Like, like uh, what I'm saying, what I, what I said about diverting oil and gas flows to Asia is that we will have less revenue and bigger cost. So that factor of withdrawal of Western technology companies also adds to the cost. So that redu further reduces profit. And profit is something which is useful because if the industry is not so profitable, then uh, what are we talking about? There will be no money for maintaining Putin's grip on power, for continuing the war, and, and uh, so on. Now, on nuclear option, listen... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we got to be a bit careful with forecasts after what he did on uh, February 24th uh, because I, I really believe that he would not launch this war because, because I specifically made these predictions that a Russian army will be weak, it will be not a, capable of capturing cities, and the urban warfare with, will cause great destruction and uh, bloodshed of the magnitude that we haven't seen even in Sarajevo and uh, Grozny, uh, that Ukraine will resist, that was all visible. Uh, but Putin still went for it. It's another question why he did it. But we do not know. Uh, uh, what we do know, several things. First, uh, Russian elite is very much aware that if there's going to be an all-out nuclear war with the West, they're going to lose very quickly, and it will be the end. Proof, uh, if you know Russian, Google, Рогозин, Россия проиграет Америке войну за шесть часов. Russia will lose a war to America in six hours. Nine years ago, in 2013, Рогозин was so stupid to give a lecture, public lecture. He actually, he wanted to lobby for more money to beef up our strategic nuclear uh, potential, right? So he essentially said that in a few hours, America will destroy 90% of our strategic nuclear potential with high-precision non-nuclear strikes. That was his point. So point number one, we do know that Russian elite is well aware that an all-out nuclear war means total loss in a very short period of time. Uh, point number two, uh, I do not see, we, many people discuss uh, use of tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield in Ukraine. Uh, I do not see much military sense in that, 
maybe I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. If, if there is, I mean, let's let's discuss that. But the consequences for Russia will be horrific. That will be a red line for for many people. It will it will only stimulate further very tough rounds of pressure from the international community. This time, probably including the countries which so far refrain from uh, from going against Putin and participating in sanctions and so on. So downsides uh, from using a tactical nuclear weapon, significant. Upsides, maybe Putin sees it, I just don't. So I mean, let's be careful with forecasts here, but uh, I see it still uh, more as a blackmail option. But again, we, don't, we, we gotta be prepared for different scenarios. As with this war, uh, preparedness, uh, is one way to guarantee uh, a proper response. If, if, if we're not prepared, then really uh, some, um, some unexpected terrible things might happen. Okay, thank you. Neighbor? Thank you very much. Lawrence Kettle, I'm an associate fellow with the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. First of all, thank you for your really in-depth insights. I think it's really, it's, you raised some really excellent um, points there about how the YouTube channels, for example, more and more people in Russia are starting to see what's really happening and, you know, the dissent is building and your analysis of that, that this could lead to the cracks that you were talking about in the structure. But... There is something uh, further to that, because I'm not going to ask you to make, you know, futuristic predictions. We know that in planning and strategic planning, it's, you know, that's uh, not necessarily uh, possible. But I would like to point out something about one of Vladimir Putin's personal idols, and that's Yuri Andropov. And to remind some people who might not be familiar with Soviet history of what happened in Hungary in 1956 when that same dissent and uprising started, he convinced Nikita Khrushchev to bring in the military and smash that resistance hard. Now, I completely agree with you. I want to make this very clear that we need to spread that message that Putin is lying to his population and um, in order to really show the cracks. But what happens, because, you know, he's taken a leaf out of Yuri Andropov's book several times. What happens if he does it again? And do you think that's a potential a possibility? Or do you really believe that, as you quoted in your CNN interview, his days are actually numbered? Thank you. Uh, is when, when he really feels the danger, uh, he will shoot. No question about it. This is actually the reason. People asking why Russians are not protesting. Because of this. Because we saw what happened in Kazakhstan in January. Also with the participation of Russian troops. We saw what happened in Belarus since 2020. We also, we have been shot. Uh, and we know, people are actually well aware. Well, uh, we had several rounds of imprisonment of people for protesting, like Balotne, which happened 10 years ago, and then the Moscow case in 2019 after Moscow elections. Unfortunately, I have to say that uh, all of the people who got real prison terms uh, for, for participation in that protest, their lives were broken. They came out broken. Uh, even some of them, Sergei Makhnatkin had died after injuries he sustained in prison. So yes, he will shoot. Yes, he will shoot. Point is that uh, uh, when, when the population turns up against him, first, uh, this will be some sort of flood that he will no longer be able to contain with just shooting, right? That will be okay. People will calm down for a while but they will never again fall in love with him and, and never support what he's doing. And this is what I've been explaining earlier on. When they will just simply wait when the system weakens enough for them to come back. This is what's going to happen. So we need to weaken the system for the people uh, to come back. And uh, second, uh, and I, this is actually why 
still uh, repressions in a lot of ways are targeted because uh, it, 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 it has a backfiring boomerang effect. If, if you go extreme cruelty, that ruins your, your public support. People don't like it. This is what I called in the 93 effect uh, in a standoff uh, between Yeltsin and Supreme Soviet. Most people supported Yeltsin, uh, particularly in Moscow, 80 to 20 percent supported Yeltsin. But the shooting, people said, no, sorry, we didn't order that. Uh, Boris, we, we were with you, but that, that it came to, I mean, so far as this, we do not approve that. Which is why immediately after the shooting, uh, Yeltsin lost uh, uh, support in parliament. Uh, 93 Duma elections brought uh, the opposition to majority and so on. So that is sort of similar. They are really well aware. Again, uh, it's important that they, they carefully monitor public opinion and they do have constraints in this regard, which will not stop them from shooting once they really feel life-threatening danger, right? But this will not stop the, the, you know, the course of history. So it, it, will only, it will only hold certain events but once the flood is there, I mean, uh, eventually, this is what I meant in my CNN interview. Uh, right now, I think it's much more realistic to speak about the end of the regime as ever before. Because without such a stress as caused by this war, it could have lingered on for an, like an indefinite period. No indefinite period now. Uh, we're, o we're only testing the limits of how much he can hold on with such enormous stress that, that was created. Yeah, maybe a question from my side. One of the aspects also uh, was, you know, protests coming from soldiers' mothers. Uh, as far as we know, uh, uh, what is estimated at the moment, around about 15,000, 20,000 soldiers died. And usually you have around about four times as many wounded people. So you could say around about 50,000 damaged people, uh, wounded uh, soldiers are already there. Uh, do you think that this could have an effect uh, that, I mean, the relatives, the mothers, the fathers uh, could go into a phase of strong protest? Uh, it's complicated. Uh, because uh, I would strongly advise you to look at this. There was a map uh, produced, I don't remember by whom, but it's widely circulating. Uh, there was a map of casualties uh, distributed by the Russian regions. And, and there's an amazing overlap with poverty. They don't send people from Moscow, Petersburg, and uh, uh, big cities into heavy combat people from really very poor regions go, where there is a significantly less value of life. If you see the interviews of the relatives, listen, this is one of the most unimaginable moments uh, that drives me crazy. Uh, because journalists talk to them, their you know, son, husband, relative was killed, and they say, well, maybe this was necessary because the government sent him there, then it means it was necessary. So he might have done for some, so he might have died for some just cause. And the question is, what is the cause? What the hell was the purpose of him going there? We don't know, but the government must know better. And the relative just died. I mean, this is, but this really, there's a correlation because they, they know, they just do not send, uh, they do mm -hmm. not send, uh, uh, many soldiers and officers from from big yeah. urban uh, areas uh, in this regard. So uh, I think again, if if you look at the opinion polling, uh, the biggest factor which will drive uh, the popular negativity would still be economy and and deterioration of uh, living standards, and the fact that uh, we are we are into a prolonged conflict. Uh, because the people were 
initially convinced by television that this thing's going to end up very soon and victoriously. Nobody wants a prolonged, troubled, bloody conflict. There's zero demand for that, even among the hardline uh, Putin supporters. So I would rather say that these factors will be the most important driving the mm -hmm. further protests. Okay, yeah, yes, over there, the lady. Levada Center has um, published um, results of a survey uh, showing that 80% of adult Russians support Putin. It was like two months ago, I guess. Uh, what do you think? Um, how did it develop uh, in the meantime? At uh, which number are we now yeah. in Russia? Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, that, that the, you're quoting the uh, poll which was published at the end of March. Uh, there was another one at the end of April. So few things, again, I mentioned that in my introductory speech. In that same poll, only 29 people said that they watch events closely, events around Ukraine. Then uh, there was a division. Uh, they asked uh, people, uh, not just do you support or, or not. They said, do you firmly support uh, unconditionally or more support than oppose? So there was always this about a third of people in every age group, uh, which is included in the 80%, but support is conditional. They say more support, which means that for some reasons they, they, they support it, but uh, it can change quickly. And it happened during a month because the solid support, definitely yes. In that March poll, which you're quoting, was 53. And it, 53%. And it declined to 45 by end April. Now, another important thing is that there are many, I, I can go into details if you like, but the bottom line is that uh, pollsters have identified by different methods that about 10, 15 percent uh, of the respondents refuse to answer the question honestly do you support the war or not? Special operation, as they say it. And about 90% of those people who refuse to answer are against the war. Meaning that when you have 53 solid support, according to Levada poll, given that 10, 15% delta, it means that it's below 50 already. And if it's 45, that means it's closer to 30. So, so that means it's not too much. Dynamic is very bad for Putin. If, if it goes that pace, by the fall of this year, all support will be gone. Uh, collapse is pretty remarkable. There is another poll uh, which was done by, uh, th that is uh, probably more important because there was not a poll which asked the people a question head on, do you support the war or not? That was a poll done by Group M, the international advertising uh, company, which, said, which asked people a question, which media source do you trust most? television, internet, news websites, or social media. So in mid-March, television led by 33% as a dominating trustful source of information. It collapsed to 23 by end April, leveling off with social media, which also grew to 23. By, also according to recent Levada poll, YouTube, for the first time ever, had surged to 45% as a major source of information for, for, for the Russians. That is remarkable. If these dynamics continue, I mean, in a in few months' time, there will be little left of what is called uh, support for the war. So it, what is important about the polling are the nuances. If you're interested, uh, I can email you the link to my article in English about that, which I published recently, explaining all these different polling uh, nuances. So when you mentioned the 80% figure, it is generally correct, but there are many nuances about that, which we should not forget about. Okay, Dr. Haider. Uh, first, I want uh, also I want to thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, one point: Which role do you think the Russian Church, the Orthodox Church, plays also in relation to 
its role which it has in the Ukraine. And uh, the other thing uh, which was striking for me when you speak about Russia, you speak about us and not about them, even you are here. Uh, so how do you feel as a Russian in such a situation and how do Russians like you in generally feel because you must have some kind of wish to get your country out of this dilemma? Uh, listen, uh, I feel encouraged. I left Russia in, uh, in March 2021. And I was living in a standard residential neighborhood, walking around with my son, my dog, going to same grocery stores. It was one of the most, the third most populous district in Moscow, yes, anyway. And uh, I mean, I couldn't move 10, 15 meters without being approached by somebody who was thanking me for everything that, that the opposition was doing, saying how much they support us, uh, even asking for a selfie or an order. That, that is, you can see it on, on the internet. There, are, there, there was like thriving, plentiful selfies with myself around. And I only had, in all these years, uh, I had like, like a couple of people uh, approaching me saying, you're a goddamn liberal on Western payroll, like two times, three times most. But uh, sympathizers uh, all the time. I even had a story when I was uh, speaking at, um, in Baltisk, which is a Russian naval base in Kaliningrad Oblast. And we were speaking on this uh, uh, semi-island, which is nearing the Polish border. There's some resort in there. And then we were shipped back to the main embankment uh, to wait for a taxi. And somebody, some resident of Baltisk, was, was jogging on the embankment early morning. And there was this big Navy ships and so on. And he stops and says, oh, you Milov, I'm watching you on YouTube all the time. I wanted to say thank you. So right now, we receive enormous feedback from across the country, like, you know, I, I, my personal feedback is like about 250, 300 cities across the country, which is, is just the emails and messages uh, that I read. Uh, hate mail from Putin supporters, thin. I receive it also, but very marginal. So I can sort of more or less judge what, the, what is the temperature in, in, inside a society, which when, when I say we, I know that we, we have much better uh, understanding with, with all these people that, that than uh, Putin's government. We did a lot of campaigning in the past f uh, few years. And listen, what, what the, the one big difference with all these previous periods, 80s, 90s that I remember, is that everybody in the country, including the very Putin supporters, they are very well aware that like Unlike any other period in Russian history, government and government-related oligarchy has a lot of money, a lot of money, out there somewhere in their castles behind barbed wire. But this money is not for them, ordinary folks. And that is the system. That is actually very well understood by everybody in Russia. So this is why <laughs> when I say we, it's, it's really very easy. Uh, uh, to actually draw this parallel and uh, to reach out to ordinary folks who are really watching us in big numbers. This is why we do not identify ourselves as the marginal minority. No, we, 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 can, uh, uh, we can win the majority. And sorry, what was the first uh, part of the question? The role of the church. Ah, church. I think the, the role of the church in the society is greatly exaggerated. Uh, the, I would offer you several criteria. First, attendance uh, of uh, churches on holidays, Christmas <coughs> and Easter. There is a very funny argument uh, going on uh, every year between the Russian Ministry of Interior and uh, uh, Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, Ministry of Interior usually says like three to five million people attended church holiday celebrations in churches. And the Russian Orthodox Church says, well, how can you say that? This is offensive. Such a small number. It was six to seven million. 
which is still a fragment <laughs> of the Russian population. Uh, if, you, if you take a look at some polls, uh, like Pew Research did a very good poll, international poll, on the importance of religions, uh, religion in daily lives of the people. Russia, less than 20% say that religion is very important in their daily life. Uh, anything like uh, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Russian Orthodox Church managed to get uh, introduced in, in, in schools, they introduced uh, a specific topic, uh, studying the basics of orthodoxy. But there was a big public outcry, so they did it not as a mandatory, but uh, parents had to choose between uh, basics of orthodoxy, basics of Islam, Buddhism, and uh, secular ethics. Guess which course was chosen the most in cities, in urban areas? Secular ethics. And many, I can go on for hours. So yeah, church has some importance in like cementing this whole uh, notion of traditional values. It's, it's just one more of the line of uh, traditional values which, uh, which make people numb. You cannot revolt because this is a tradition, has been there for, for ages. And tradition this, tradition that, including the church, right? As a separate entity, uh, it's not that overly uh, influential. I would say its influence is limited, but on elderly generation, which is the most consciously supportive of Putin and the war, uh, church is an important factor, unlike the youth where its influence is, uh, I would say, negligible. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And this is uh, also the last question. Then I finish the list, please. Uh. Um, the last question of, uh, the, regarding the, uh, the religion. When you were talking about the Orthodox Church, and um, there are some, let's say, some opinions that put in, um, has a very strong um, relationship to the Orthodox, to the Russian Orthodox Church. And um, the problem was this autocephalia with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Do you think this was one of the drivers why Putin uh, wanted to get Ukraine back also under the head of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church? And he was arguing in a way that he had a very much strong interest in returning the Ukrainian Green Church back to the Russian um, the Orthodox Church. This was one question. The other question was, um, when you talk about uh, the big movement or the expected movement that uh, the Russian population uh, will once uh, have the feeling to go on the streets and demonstrate, how long does it take until Putin's um, police is able to put them all down and to destroy all these demonstrations? I think I already answered this question. Uh, we discussed this about whether Putin will be inclined to shooting people. Yes, he will. Yes, he will be. Uh, which means that uh, there is a, if, if some demonstrations are premature, if they take place uh, before the government substantially weakens, uh, then it might get really bloody and messy, which, which is my prediction is that uh, the strongest demonstration will happen uh, once the regime weakens significantly and it will be publicly visible. That it cannot do anything about the, about the war, about the economy, about China, about Russia's positions in the world, and people will sort of start to openly question it, like, what is this thing all about? Uh, where are we going? So uh, the less self-confident the regime will be, uh, I think uh, the shyer the response will be. More self-confidence, more brutality and uh, suppression. I think the correlation is uh, like this. Now, on an Orthodox Church uh, story, again, uh, as with the rare earth and metals, I would advise against a bit narrowing it down. Uh, by the time the churches have separated, uh, we were already worlds apart. Russia and Ukraine. This was just an added component, maybe. But Putin was already very angry uh, with the fact that uh, after the spring of 2014, 
Putin was extremely angry and he, he actually fired a lot of people who were specifically responsible for that project. He believed uh, that once an outright pro-Western government would come to power in Kyiv, that this whole greater east and south of Ukraine, mostly Russian speaking, would tend to break away and separate and say, we don't want this, we will go back to Russia. He, he genuinely believed in that crap, which his ideological advisors have been feeding him. He was absolutely angry and mad when this did not happen. And this was far more important than the, the, the uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Church issue. Now, on uh, the matter of influence, uh, in terms of what influences Putin, he's a cherry picker. He's influenced by stuff that he likes. So it's not that the Orthodox Church is that, that influences him, because we also see within the Russian Orthodox Church on the bottom level, there is also a visible anti-war movement. You have a lot of news about priests actually speaking out and even being expelled because of their anti-war position. But Putin doesn't listen to those. He listens only to uh, a very narrow, uh, dark-minded, ultra-conservatives like uh, Shevkunov because he, he simply likes what they say. So they can be from any church, not particularly orthodox. If he likes what they say, uh, then uh, you know he's also been uh, visiting the Buddhist temples together with Shaigu in uh, eastern Siberia. He's, he's absolutely nothing. As long as they say what he likes to hear, that's, that's his universal religion, I would put it this way. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, then. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have not got, not only got the lesson, you know, about what is going on, especially behind the scene. We got so many insights into Russian politics and relations. Uh, I would say it was not only knowledge, but it was a lot of wisdom behind it. And insofar, I also would like to ask a very last question uh, concerning the relations between European people, uh, between us and the Russian people. Because the war always has, of course, the tendency that people uh, would try, you know, to assemble behind their nation, behind their leader and so on. And therefore my question, what can we do? What do we have to do in order not to alienate the Russian people too far from our uh, our people, not to alienate uh, the people's hearts, uh, but make it what, what it is, Putin's war, not more and not less? Uh, that's a very important question and several things. First, uh, I think we, we actually need not to be shy and uh, we are not shy about uh, speaking openly to the Russian people and actually bringing them to realize what kind of harm and destruction and horrible things Russia as a nation has been doing in Ukraine. We need to have this honest debate uh, in, in the Russian society. So uh, you also need to understand that we, we, we're not trying to sort of cover ourselves like, listen, it's all, it's all Putin, but we are good Russians. No, it's more complicated. So we need to have this honest uh, soul searching in the Russian society, similar as Germany did after, after uh, the Second World War. But uh, uh, we are absolutely encouraged uh, by the number of highly knowledgeable people in European politics and expert community who are absolutely aware of, of all the troubles and complicated uh, things that, that Russian society has been going through who still do not lose hope for a normal democratic Russia. I think the best example in this regard is my friend uh, Andrius Kubilius, the former prime minister of Lithuania. He, he's a member of European Parliament now and uh, he established an uh, in, in, inter, inter-party caucus called Friends of European Russia, specifically promoting the idea that Russia not only can but will indeed be normal and democratic back again 
and we need to encourage that and work with it and, and uh, cooperate. We, we have multiple different mm-hmm. projects, uh, uh, starting from enlightenment and educational programs to assistant, uh, assisting the, the free voices who continue to speak and broadcast to the Russian people and uh, changing the public opinion to like multiple issues that they're also doing a lot of uh, good uh, uh, online discussions and then offline discussions about important things. But it's very encouraging to see that, that uh, many people in Europe actually realize that, yes, we do have a democratic future. That also, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a matter of doing this with our own hands. We're not asking anybody to do our, this job for us. But uh, uh, there, there are very clear dimensions where Europeans can help, uh, can encourage us and, and offer moral support uh, to Russians who denounce Putinism, denounce aggression, denounce uh, war, and this whole notion of like Russian exclusivity and the uh, zones of influence and so on. There are many people uh, like that, and uh, they should be encouraged in their aspirations for, for European future and normality. Thank you for doing that. And uh, this is, is, is not something that we're talking should emerge from scratch. A lot, a lot is already being done and uh, uh, this will be fruitful efforts. Uh, Russia, with, with, despite all that is happening uh, right now, uh, Russia will be back on track. Uh, and it will go through a very painful reckoning of uh, what, is, what has happened. This is our big internal problem, but we have to go through it. But we will be back on track. And I wanted to thank many Europeans who understand that and uh, uh, who show solidarity with us in this uh, dark moment. This is, uh, of course, the ones who are really suffering now are Ukrainians. And we, we fully support their struggle. Uh, but uh, it's important to understand that uh, we were under attack long before, uh, ever since uh, Putin came to power. And uh, he, he, he gradually transformed Russian society into this monster that we never imagined that could possibly happen. So again, thank you for, for your solidarity and your vision of a better future for, for all of us. Thank you. Yeah.